we're going to continue this month's lesson, which is prosperity consciousness. Prosperity represents the idea of attaining your most innermost desires and your outermost needs. It's the idea of you attaining that which your body inside you and those material things that make you think you got it all together. Many identify vast material abundance as prosperity. Some people perceive a superior mental or intellectual acumen as prosperity. Others value the depth of spiritual enlightenment as the ultimate gateway to prosperity. But anyone who embodies and masters the fundamental principles required in manifesting the life that they desire is truly prosperous. Ernest Holmes says a person that demonstrates the ability to bring greater possibilities and happier conditions into their experience is living a successful life. When we achieve our goal, when we win the game, we're considered successful. But everybody doesn't have the skill of a little Brown James. So you may not win every game you play. Everybody isn't blessed with a special talent of achieving every single goal that they set before them. So what I want you to understand is that if you are a loving person, if you are a kind person, if you are a giving person, you too are ultimately successful. You see, success is synonymous with prosperity. That's why Revelation Lisa gave us the assignment of reading chapter 16 in our text. It's become clearly obvious to me, and I hope all of you, that she has deemed the year 2020 as the year of our prosperity. First quarter, she has placed an emphasis on ensuring that we all become more spiritually successful. She has declared that we should all be abundantly loving, and now she's telling us to affirm and to be affirmative in our thinking. Thus, our assignments are to express and to share spiritual prosperity, a love that prospers, and this month of prosperity consciousness. That homework that we have, the assignments that we've been given, they are not hard to complete. As long as we recognize we serve an abundant and powerful God, as long as we unify and accept our inheritance of unlimited potential, as long as we realize that all things are possible through the prosperity consciousness of the Christ, when we recognize, unify, and realize our best self, we're able to heal ourselves. We're able to resurrect ourselves. We're able to ascend to a heavenly way of thinking, which is the prosperity consciousness. We can speak a word believing and know that it shall be done. But Reverend Lisa also reminded us that being prosperous doesn't mean getting everything you want when you want it. You see, in order to get everything you want when you want it, that would require us to be in perfect alignment with spirit. And I know we're good folk, and I know we got good intentions. But I don't think everybody in here is in perfect alignment with spirit. <laughs> Ernest Holmes says, getting what you want ain't always the best thing. He says, a lot of what we want may impede the well-being of someone else. You see, we do have the potential to demonstrate our infinite power. But the reason we fall short often is because we get caught up in finite pleasures. We have not evolved to a complete understanding of our spiritual self. You see, our problem is God spoiled us. Our problem is we were blessed so abundantly we got beside ourselves. 
We couldn't handle the prosperity. Our God-given spiritual qualities of sincerity, justice, love, faith, generosity, fearlessness, and eternal presence were forfeited by our physical attraction to being deceitful, envious, lustful, slothful, greedy, prideful, and angry. So much for being perfectly aligned with spirit. But here's the good news. In spite of our choice to misunderstand our purpose, in spite of our misuse of our power, in spite of our misinterpretation of the original message, God provided a master teacher in the flesh to represent the spiritual principles we conveniently chose not to consistently apply. Jesus demonstrated all the attributes that the Father created within us. That's why Philippians 2 and 9 says, Jesus is the name of all, all names. Now I know here y'all, somebody out there, Reverend Gerald, go on that Jesus thing again. <laughs> Don't even know this is a religious science church. I always go there for this reason. It's because his nature fully demonstrated how God's power and presence can be used for the good of all. So I don't want y'all to get caught up in the alphabet, J-E-S-U-S. So you see, the appearance of those letters didn't even exist in the Aramaic language that Mary and Joseph spoke. They named the boy Yeshua. Jesus evolved from the Greek word leshes and to the Latin word jesu or jesum, which eventually became Jesus. But all variations of the name in any language represents the nature of a thing, not the thing. So what Paul was really telling the Philippians, he was telling them those who realize the power of thought that the nature of the one called Jesus, his thoughts, his words, his actions, his demonstrations, his ability to forgive, his unconditional love, his compassion, and his caring for all, and particularly those who are under Roman rule of selfish desires, and particularly those who are limited by a Pharisaic mindset or religious dogma. He was telling them that the nature of the Christ consciousness is a prosperity consciousness. And it's reflected in the original idea of man. Oh yeah. That word, that name, it represents something that's top shelf. Something of the highest quality. Something that's above all of us. By any spelling or any pronunciation, the principles taught and demonstrated by the Christ are God's idea of man in expression. He came to tell us that you can think a thing and then you can manifest the vision that you desire. But first, the human has to get out of the way. The divine has to take control. You see, when you become more like Jesus, you accept the nature of the Christ. When you fully grasp your capacity, your power, and spiritual ideas, then you have what we call the prosperity consciousness. You see, the truth is, you can have all the money, all the cars, all the property, all the jewelry, and all the clothes you desire. But that which you value most can only be purchased with mental and spiritual coin. A truly rich man, a woman of superior wealth, they are the ones who are free of misery and unhappiness. Yes. Thank you. Oh yeah, there's a whole lot of folk with a whole lot of money. There's a whole lot of folk with a whole lot of education. There's a whole lot of folk with a whole lot of stuff who are miserable yes. and unhappy. Yes. So those with a prosperity consciousness need to ask the question. Does the thing that I wish to express express more life, more happiness, and more peace for myself, and at the same time, does no harm to anyone else. Even better, you can ask this question. Is the thing that I desire 
for myself? Am I willing to do the same for someone else? Everyone here is a success because everyone here has been supplied with everything you need. Ernest Holmes says the potential of all things exists in the universal wholeness. He also reminds us that you can only advance by going from where you are to where you want to be. Now, I don't believe Ernest Holmes is referring to physical movement. I think he's referring to a mental paradigm shift. I think he's referring to a change in our perception. You see, the work begins where you are is a mental and spiritual work. When we consistently apply ourselves to the truth, then and only then are we seeking the kingdom. We gradually gain wisdom, wisdom and understanding. The more enlightened we become, the more truth we apply to our daily thoughts and actions. You see, our thoughts initiate. Our words substantiate. But it's our actions that demonstrate. Yes, that's right. Everything begins with a thought. I don't know how many times Reverend Lisa and Reverend Ryan and I and Dr. Ronnie have to say that. But just so I make sure you get it, I'm going to say it one more time. <laughs> Everything begins with a thought. <clears throat> our words declare our faith and our belief. But there must be an action that corresponds with the natural laws of the universe before success can be achieved, before your blessings are realized. The more closely our consciousness aligns with the principles of natural laws, the more accurate, the more fundamental, the more consciously prosperous we become. An author and lecturer by the name of William George Jordan, he wrote a book. Everything that he did was focused on a topic that he called mental training. He says this. He says, into the hands of every individual is given a marvelous power of good and evil. The silent, unconscious, unseen influence of life. This is simply the constant radiation of what man really is, not what he pretends to be. You see that power that you have? You can call it what you want to call it. You can claim what you want to claim. You can proclaim yourself as anything you choose. But it's how you use that power that defines who you are. How we choose to use the power endowed to us Let's folk know really what you're all about. That's right. Your life reflects what you think of, what you hold in consciousness the most. The thought comes first, but we are defined by what we do. Aristotle puts it this way. He says, we are that we reportedly, excuse me, we are that we repeatedly do. Excellence then, is not an act, but a habit. Think about that. Yes. What you repeatedly do, what you repeatedly think about, what you repeatedly hold in consciousness, that's what you are. So your activities become what happens. Habits are powerful factors because they are consistent thoughts and actions. Often there are unconscious patterns that express our character and produce our effectiveness and our intereffectiveness. Prosperity consciousness produces sustainable habits. A new way of thinking, a new way of speaking, and a new way of doing. Our prosperity, our success, our effectiveness require us placing a deeply and getting rid of all those deeply embedded negative habitual tendencies and replacing them with affirmative thoughts and positive actions. As I was thinking about this subject, you know, things just happens. And I was looking at the books on my bookshelf, and I said, one of these books has a word for us. So I just reached up and 
grab them. And what came down was a book by Stephen R. Cope. It was an international bestseller, and it was entitled The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And he talks about developing habits to be highly effective, to be successful, to be prosperous. He defines habits as the place where knowledge, skill, and desire intersect. You see, knowledge is what to do and why. Our skills are how to do, and our desires is what we want to do. But in order to make something a habit, it must contain or intersect amongst all three. You see, knowledge has no power without the skill to execute. Ability without desire produces nothing. And your desire must be supported by knowledge for progress to occur. You see, these seven habits of effective personal change require us to embody a prosperity consciousness that operates in harmony with natural law. Seven habits, he talks about, seven principles, seven systems of behavior. The first is to be proactive. The second is to begin with the end in mind. The third is to put first things first. Then he says, think win-win all the time. He says, seek understanding and then seek to be understood. He says, synergy is the key to a successful life. And then he says, at the end, the most important thing is that we receive balance and self-renewal. He's got seven habits there. Seven is the number of spiritual Seven represents fatherly perfection and resurrection. Seven equals positive change. You see, these habits guide us towards personal, professional, and spiritual achievements, which we've identified as a prosperity consciousness. So we don't have time to cover all seven today. We're going to take a good look at the first one, which is be proactive. See, proactive is more than taking initiative. Being proactive is accepting responsibility for your life. Realizing our behavior is a function of our decision, not our condition. You see, the first habit, the first blessing that you were endowed was that of dominion. You were given the freedom to choose before you were given anything else. Freedom of choice makes your life your responsibility. See, contained within responsibility is the ability to respond and not react. God's blessing of dominion allows us to control our environment, but not be controlled by it. So it's not what happens. It's how we respond to what's happening. You see, reactive folk, they're defensive and protective. They allow how somebody else is they allow how what somebody says about you to influence their behavior. They react to the environment. They react to their feelings. They react to circumstances and conditions. But proactive people, they're influenced by an internal stimuli. Yeah, we're human. So what goes on around us does affect us. But when you're proactive, instead of reacting, you respond based on a value-based choice. You see, when you were taught to turn the other cheek, they weren't telling you to let folks run over you. They were telling you to look at your alternatives. They were telling you when that something happens that you don't really like, instead of just reacting to it, consider your options. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can hurt you without your permission. <laughs> That's right. The great Mahatma Gandhi says, you can't, no one can take your self-respect unless you give it away. <laughs> and then I told you last time, the only lie that can hurt you is the one that you believe. Yep. You see, proactive people are self-aware. They know what they are, not just who they are. 
See, you can get caught up in the who, but it's the what that's important. You see, when you're proactive, your conscience leads you to do what's best for all, not just what's best for yourself. Amen. You're spiritually led, you're spiritually guided. When you're proactive, you're emotionally balanced, and you focus on your strengths. When you're proactive, you accept what is, but you're always envisioning what's possible. You set goals, and you stay entrenched in your commitment to achieve that goal. They put positive energy in things that they can change and things that they can impact. What Reverend Mind say, and the ability to do what? Change. That's where you put your energy. Don't put your energy in the stuff you can't do nothing about. Some interpret proactive to mean pushy or aggressive or insistent. But to be proactive really means to be smart. I came up with an acronym for SMART. It means to be spiritually in harmony. It means to be mentally in tune. It means to be affirmative in your word. It means to be responsive in your deed. It means to be trusting in God. It means to be smart. To be proactive is seeking the change from the inside out. To be proactive is to separate ourselves from our outside concerns and that they can influence us externally and only rely on what we influences us internally. Your concerns are seated in appearances and circumstances. They're fertilized with its and wins. When I get these bills paid off, I'm going to be all right. When this pain goes away, I'm not be able to do what I used to do. When my ship comes in, I'm not going to have any more issues. If she or he had more patience, if my kids were just a little more obedient, if I just had more time. But conversely, our inner ideas and influence, they're not seated with wins and ifs. They're seated with I can and fertilized with I can be. I can be more patient, more wise, and more loving. I can be more resourceful, diligent, and creative. I can be more cooperative, understanding, and more empathetic. See, the only difference between a problem and an opportunity is the thought that you put behind it. Anytime we think the problem is out there, that thought is the problem. Being proactive turns your test into a testimony. Yes. <clears throat> Nothing leaves a greater impression on someone than hearing a story about how someone transcends suffering, Amen. how someone overcomes a particular circumstance, uh. how someone defeats an illness or flourishes, and flourishes in spite of a handicap. You see, their demonstration of a prosperity consciousness results from being proactive in the affirmative use of the power of God within them. I saw a story on television once about this little boy who was born with no arms and no legs. Yet, he was living the happiest, most fulfilled life you could imagine. They interviewed him and he always had a smile on his face and he rolled around on the floor with no arms and no legs. He put a pencil in his mouth and draw pictures which became famous and everybody wanted one. He was born with no arms and no legs, yet he was successful. Yet he had a prosperity consciousness. He took the conditions and circumstances that he was presented and made something from them. Yes that help and enlighten other folk. Yes. Yes. The Bible is full of stories of a prosperity consciousness that took a proactive approach to a negative circumstance. Uh, I think I got some time. <laughs> Y'all remember the story about Joseph, right? Yes. Yeah. And how his brothers Yes. Teamed up against him. Yes. 
how they decided since he thought he was better than they were. He was the nice one in the bunch, and the rest of them had devilish mentalities and was messing up and vying for daddy's affection. So they decided, we're going to fix him. So it came to pass when Joseph was come to his brothers, they stripped him of the rich robe that he was wearing. And they took him and threw him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. And they sat down and ate bread and they lifted up their eyes and looked. And behold, a caravan of Arabians were coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, long and myrrh. And they were on their way to carry it down to Egypt. And Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Arabians, and let us not harm him, for he is our brother, he is our flesh. And his brothers listened to Judah. Then some Midianite merchants passed by, and they threw and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold him to the Arabians for 20 pieces of silver. And they brought him in to Egypt. Joseph was put in a very compromising position. His brothers, which represents the faculties that are prone to material understanding, they took his colorful robe from him, meaning they held his vivid imagination captive. Joseph means imagination. They were resisting their awakening of spiritual truth and their ability to serve a, a new idea. So they threw him in a pit with no water. They were limiting the access to awareness of spiritual potential. They looked up and saw spiritual ideas descending from Gilead, that higher place in consciousness, the place that brings a renewed consciousness of love. So Judah, who had developed just a little more in spirit than the rest of the brothers, spirit told him, let's not kill him. Let's not kill our father's son. Let's keep him alive and let's see if we can make a little money off of him. So they bartered the spiritual consciousness away they got it away from them and sent it into Egypt. They let imagination be enslaved. They decided to limit him by surrounding him with the personality of a sense consciousness. Joseph was in a bad situation. And the situation progressively got worse. But he never compromised his integrity. He focused on what he would become. So as a servant to Pharaoh, he was proactive and he kept dreaming. And all of a sudden, Pharaoh saw how proactive he was, saw how his attitude was, and asked him to interpret some of his dreams. There was a new vision coming from Joseph. But he refused to compromise, refused to go back to that negative way of thinking that his brothers possessed. So they actually threw him in prison for 13 years. Being a servant wasn't harsh enough. They decided to throw him in prison. Guess what happened? If you keep reading, you find out that Joseph became the man in charge at the prison. Yes. <coughs> so no matter what they did, he took lemons and made what? Lemonade. Because he had a prosperity consciousness. And at the end of the day, if you read your book, you find out that Joseph rose to become the governor of Egypt one step below the Pharaoh himself. So see, this Bible story describes a struggle for spiritual development. See, your relatives may betray you. Your ruler may imprison you. But all we need to change is our inner perception. All we need to do is practice the habit of productivity, proactivity. We need to keep your commitments. You need to be a light, not a judge. You need to be a model, not a critic. 
You need to be the solution, not the problem. You need to be compassionate, not accusatory. You need to seek to change yourself from the inside out. You see, we were all responsible for our own happiness. And we're also responsible for most of our circumstances. That's right. But when we let the prosperity consciousness rule, the Lord makes a way out of no way. Right. Your trials become tributes. Yes. Your tests become testimonies. That's right. Being proactive is not just running willy-nilly up and down the street. <laughs> Being proactive is taking some time to figure out how can I respond to this situation. I know it looks bleak. I know it looks dim. But if I believe what I say about God, then God's got to be somewhere in this room. Whether the flow is dry or whether the flow is flooded, he's still somewhere in this room. So we need to figure out what we're going to do when it's dry. But we need to really get prepared to do something when it's flooded. <laughs> when it's flooded, what are we going to do? We're going to build an ark of a new consciousness. We're going to rise above the circumstances and take everything we need to continue on. And once the flood subsides, we're going to pick up right where we left off and everything's going to be just like it was before the flood came. A prosperity consciousness gives you the ability to determine the life that you live. Woo! God bless yes, you. Yes.